Okay, um, so uh, I wanted to first thank the organizers all over the room uh, for, for, this, for this wonderful opportunity. It's been a lot of fun the last two days now. Um, and uh, I know this has been delayed by three years due to COVID, but I'm glad we were able to come together here. Um, so uh, I'll talk about uh, some um, newer work in the group. Um, in the spirit of a lot of the talks so far, uh, a lot of the work here that I'm going to show uh, is, is fairly preliminary. So if you have comments, questions, please uh, you know, interrupt. Um, it'll, it'll be nice to have uh, feedback and ask questions throughout the talk. Uh, and in the limit of, uh, in, the, in the spirit of sort of saying that a lot of, that we don't understand many things, I'll put quotations and question marks uh, uh, to, to really indicate that a lot of this is still ongoing. Um, so this, this work uh, started in the heart of the pandemic uh, with, a, with, a, with a freak Zoom call. I got an email one day from uh, Madan Rao and Shrikant Shastri. Madan's here. Shrikant is also in Europe, it turns out, but not here. Um, Shrikant is, works at JNCSR in Bangalore, asking if they, if, uh, if, you, if I wanted to discuss um, the, the, the role dissipation plays in, uh, in, in, in memory in, in a colloidal context. And that's, so that's how this, this got started, uh, and this evolved into, uh, into, into, into the story I'm going to tell you today. Um, a lot, all, all of the work was, was done by a brilliant grad student of, of mine at, at UChicago, uh, Agnish Kumar uh, Behara. So there are a lot of terms here. Uh, there's a diverse audience, and so I'll try to explain uh, what these individual terms mean and how putting, to, putting them together, we find some surprises. Um, as I explain these terms, uh, a, lot of you, a, lot, a lot of the basic concepts might be familiar to, 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 to some of you, so I apologize uh, for that, but I'll try to introduce it to, the best, to my best possible ability and then, then move on. Um, so first, associative memory. Uh, this is something that we all possess, we all have. Uh, I uh, originally come from India, from the southern part of India. Um, and uh, like clockwork, or almost like clockwork, um, around the end of May, beginning June, uh, we have the monsoon rains, and growing up with that um, has uh, trained my olfactory system. So when, I, when, when my olfactory system senses this molecule, this is the molecule that bacteria emits when the first rain hits the soil, it evokes in my, in my, uh, in my head very vivid memories of what rain looks like and, and my experiences as a, as a child. So this notion of taking a stimulus of one sort uh, and associating it with something else is basically called associative uh, memory. Uh, this happens not only in higher level organisms like, like us, it happens in uh, Drosophila. Um, and in, in the case of Drosophila, you can actually train it. You can, you can sort of train it such that you, uh, uh, you uh, for some odors you give rewards, for other odors you don't get rewards. And you can actually see how in the Drosophila olfactory system, in a, uh, in, in, in part of the Drosophila brain, connections get built up as, 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 as the Drosophila gets trained repeatedly. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a marriage between associative memory, concepts like this, uh, and the concepts we sort of heard in the first uh, three talks this morning on, uh, on activity or, or active matter, and I'm going to sort of talk about how there's an intersection between these two things. At this point, hopefully it's not very apparent what this intersection looks like. Uh, but I'll talk about how there may be an intersection between these two things uh, and how insights from one field can actually be very useful uh, for, a, for a different field. So let me move ahead. Uh, I've sort of introduced associative memory in a very abstract way in the, uh, in the, context, of a, in the context of fairly complex uh, circuits, circuitries like the olfactory system. Um, this associative memory is, is a, fairly, uh, a fairly important prototypical kind of memory. It, it's, it's also important, for instance, in our hippocampus, the way we tend to uh, remember spatial locations uh, using place cells uh, uh, also require, also involves associative memory processes. It's, it's also there in many, many other uh, biological contexts. Um, but we can abstract a lot of this away into a, into a fairly, um, into, into a fairly, into a much simpler setting. Uh, so this is an image of a fair, of, of a famous physicist, uh, Leo Kadanoff. Um, and uh, if I imagine storing this pattern of, uh, in, in my brain or in, or in, or in some device, uh, an associative memory process would be one where I start off with an initial signal. So I can start off with this half with a the, with the, with the small fraction of Leo's face, and uh, whatever associated memory device I have should be able to then recover the entire pattern. Okay? And if this happens, then that's, that's sort of associative memory. So the first thing I'm going to talk about, and this is all a background, is um, 
how do we, how, how can we sort of understand this from a statistical mechanical basis? And again, a lot of this will be familiar to a lot of you in the room, so I apologize. I'll sort of go over the basics first and then talk about how things are put together. So, um, uh, how do we store patterns? So, the, the sort of so the, the, the simplest textbook example of something that is an embarrassing pattern is let's imagine we have a, a two-dimensional Ising model um, and let's imagine the, the sort of two patterns we can imagine there, uh, a system in which uh, we have all spins up or all spins down um, and um, an associative memory-like process in the context of this very, very minimal uh, uh, Hamiltonian would, would look like the following. I start the system off with a corrupted version of the ground states and the system can then evolve and, and, and uh, correct itself and find the right ground state. So this is my initial signal and this, this very simple system has an associative memory-like uh, like, uh, property in, in, the, in the context of what I just described in the previous slide in that it's able to take an, a corrupted version of the ground state have dynamics that evolve you to the full ground to the to the correct ground states, uh, but this is just, this is just two patterns. How do we generalize this? How do we go beyond uh, two? Uh, and this brings me to uh, what will be a vehicle for the for the for the for the majority of my talk, the Hopfield model or Hopfield networks. So these are paradigmatic models for um, uh, for memory storage. Uh, this was uh, first put forward by Hopfield, Nino, and others in the, in the, in the 1980s, and has uh, since then uh, evolved into uh, uh, evolved into uh, evolved into a, a foundational model in, in neural networks and also some parts of neuroscience. Um, so, how does this work? Uh, it's sort of it's it's, it's actually inspired by. Uh, by neural learning rules. So let's say I have this image of Leo Kadanov space again, and I abstract it down into something that just has four spins or four pixels, two, two dark pixels and two white pixels. Um, and if I want to remember this image, what do I do? I see it repeatedly, I, I watch it repeatedly, I train my, I train my neurons repeatedly. Um, and uh, there's a rule in neuroscience that says that uh, uh, if two neurons get fired together or fired together all the time, multiple times, uh, they end up getting wired together with, uh, with positive synaptic connections. Uh, and so in this context, uh, if, uh, if I keep seeing this kind of a pattern uh, and I try to learn them, um, I'll build up neurons such that these two neurons uh, get, get, get hooked up with a positive synaptic connection. These get hooked up with a negative synaptic uh, uh, connection. And the end result of this is if, is if I'm shown a partial pattern, if I'm shown a pattern that just has Two, down, two white cells and one dark cell, um, uh, because of this connectivity here, I can sort of output the full pattern, I can output the full image. So this is, this is, this is what it would take to get an associative memory-like system uh, in the context of spins or neurons and how, how one would learn connectivity. This is just one. Um, what if you want to do more than one? Uh, the same neuroscience rule says that you can actually do it. Um, so if you want to sort of uh, you know, learn one image, go ahead and train in this manner. If you want to learn a second image of a cat, uh, you go ahead, do the same process. Now you sort of overwrite your previous neurons. You have some, some, some memory from your previous image. You overwrite or overload that memory with new memories, with new connectivities. And if you want to sort of do this again, you can. Uh, and this way, if you sort of, if you, you can actually, uh, this prescription allows you to potentially Come up with hook up, uh, come up with connectivity, and potentially learn uh, multiple multiple memories or multiple images in this context. So, will this work? It looks like magic, sort of, uh, but it's 19. It, it's been working since the 1980s, so we know it will. But I'll sort of go through this again. Um, and what about crisscrossing connections? So, Hopfield Hopfield's insight was that such ideas will actually end up working out uh, in a more mathematical uh, context. Um, Hopfield wrote down um, uh, a spin-based model uh, in which uh, each pixel here is a spin, sigma i, um, and uh, the connectivity between, uh, the, the, there's an interaction matrix that determines the energy of this entire spin system. The, that interaction matrix is Jij. And this Jij is basically constructed using the procedure I showed you in the, in the previous slide. You just learn images one after, other, one after the other after the other, and you just sum up the connections from all those images. Mathematically, it looks like a product of two rank one tensors here, uh, summed over all the patterns you want to learn, but the, 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 the basic essence of this formula is contained in the learning rule I showed you uh, in, the, in the previous slide. And um, 
Um, one of the uh, remarkable features about this, about this model is that uh, once you write down this Hamiltonian, Hopfield was able to, Hopfield and many others following Hopfield were able to uh, show how this kind of an energy landscape, the energy landscape that's, that's created by this Hamiltonian, can actually, uh, in, in some conditions, have metastable states at the very least around the desired patterns you want to store, uh, and that's how you end up uh, l learning and uh, potentially recovering patterns. Uh, and again, I sort of, I, everything I want to talk about doesn't, will be in the context of Hopfield-like models. If I have time, I'll sort of generalize this towards the end. I'm not sure how much time I'll have, but I just wanted to point out that these, these ideas can be much, much more broadly applied, uh, even though I'm sort of using the Hopfield model as a, as a vehicle. So again, in, this, in the context of this kind of a, a memory storage paradigm, you set up your system, and the Hopfield, the Hopf, Hopfield's idea in sort of basically ensures that the energy landscape you construct once you have a Hamiltonian of the sort is going to look, uh, is going to have in, in, in some conditions this very nice feature that the memories you want to store sit at, at the very least, metastable points of your landscape. So now if you start off with a corrupted version of, a, of, of, a, of, an, of an alpha, of, a, of a, uh, a word you have stored, or in this case two letters you have stored, uh, the system can flow down the landscape either at zero temperature or even at finite temperature it turns out, uh, and recover the full memory. So that's what associative memory looks like in this, in this context, uh, and, the, and the, the, the sort of driving insight from Hopfield was to sort of put the, this idea of memory in the context of spin glasses, in the context of uh, energetic landscapes and statistical mechanics. So, um, th so this is what uh, Hopfield's model give, gives us. Uh, in some conditions, uh, we get some effective free energies uh, that are protected by, by walls. Um, and this is what happens if um, uh, you try to store a number of fractions that's not, that's not super large. What, what large means, what, uh, what these limits mean, I'll come to in a second. But if you don't get very greedy, if you have a, if you have a certain number of neurons and you want to store a, a fraction of patterns, um, you can actually get this kind of a landscape. If you get very greedy, however, and you, and you want to store a number of patterns uh, that uh, is way in excess of the number of neurons you have, for example, uh, what you end up getting are things that look like this. So you, you, you want to design things that, that, that look like this, where your memory states are protected by, by, by wells or barriers. But what you end up getting, if you sort of become very greedy, are, are situations like this, where your memory states are, are not protected. They're protected by very shallow wells. You get spurious memories and, and, and many other similar related things. The transition between these two ends up being a very sharp transition. Um, and generally, uh, if you have situations with good recovery, you can go through the thought experiment I mentioned in the first slide, take an initial pattern, recover everything. Uh, and if you have bad recovery, if you sort of get very greedy in the greedy phase, you start with this and you get all kinds of corrupted signals. You get a cat, you get Einstein, you get many, many other things. Um, so just in terms of numbers, um, the, the capacity of this Hopfield model, the, the sort of thing I've written down, at zero temperature is 0.138n, where n is the number of uh, spins, so it grows linearly with the number of neurons you have in your system. Um, and as you add temperature, the capacity keeps decreasing. At a temperature of, of, of about one in the units, uh, in units relevant to everything I've talked about, the capacity goes to zero and you can't store anything. That's sort of the broad picture of the Hopfield model. Uh, what I have here is a caricature of that kind of a phase diagram, done in a slightly different uh, setting, but the, the broad ideas remain the same. This is how it looks. Uh, there is this region here where you, where you can retrieve memory on the x-axis. I have plotted, uh, what is plotted is the, is the fractional capacity, the number of memories by the number of neurons. Um, at some point, you can't store anything. Uh, as you increase temperature, you keep losing memory. Uh, and the transition uh, is a sharp transition. That's this line here. Um, and there's also a further line up here uh, denoting a different kind of transition that I'm happy to talk to you later on. Uh, these ideas find applications in many contexts from self-assembly, recurrent neural networks, uh, and even things like transformers and chat GPT turns out in the, in the more modern context. Okay, so this is what we have. This is the picture we have. Uh, uh, the question you're sort of trying to ask was, all these ideas are sort of built on, a, on the framework of equilibrium statistical mechanics. There's a notion of connectivity, there's a notion of temperature, which sort of determines this kind of a phase diagram here. Um, there's no reason for us to expect that a biological system of, this, of, of the Drosophila sort or what happens in our brains satisfy the kind of dynamics you would get at equilibrium. There are, there are the, the dynamics that are much more exotic. There's no expectation that synthetic systems that use these ideas should also satisfy 
equilibrium like dynamics. So the question is sort of trying to ask was, what if we start to play with the dynamics, the neurons or the spins used to sample this rugged landscape? Um, can we actually change this picture um, in a manner that makes capacity better? So for instance, can we get things that look like this? Or um, you know, you know, a, a much more provocative thing would be, can we get things that look like this? So can we have a system that um, once you change dynamics, you're actually getting you're getting to access memories that you have no business remembering at all. Um, so that's what I want to try and talk about. Um, we were motivated by the beautiful phenomenology seen in active matter. Uh, I'll just throw up a couple of slides. We've had beautiful talks this morning, but I'll just show a couple of slides to motivate why this might even happen. And then I'll show you results, first numerical results, where uh, we see some of this phenomenology. We can sort of uh, uh, get some of these features. And then I'll show you various levels of theory which help, which go through how this might actually be stabilized in, in practice. OK, so we saw many different talks of active matter. This is, a, this is one slide that I like to throw up from uh, Paul Chaikin's work way back in 2013. Uh, this is a light-activated colloid. At a single particle level, when, once these colloids start their catalysis reaction, uh, they undergo diffusion, a diffusion process that's non-Brownian, that sort of has this persistent kind of a random walk that we were introduced to in the second, in the second talk of this, uh, of this morning. Uh, but at a many particle level, this, this biased uh, random walk or a, this persistent random walk at a many particle level leads to collective phenomenology, um, leads to these sort of light activated uh, crystals. So what's going, what's sort of um, effectively happening here in the language of free energies, if, if, I, can, if I can use that kind of a term, at least statistically here, is that uh, under equilibrium conditions, the system um, in terms of a free energy landscape with just native repulsive interactions has a free energy landscape that's basically uh, a fairly boring featureless landscape. In the presence of activity, what you're able to stabilize is you're able to sort of stabilize new states. You're able to stabilize new emergent collective uh, clumped states that did not exist at equilibrium. And so that was the basic thing for us to hold on to. That's the, that was the basic intuition for us to hold on to, uh, which is maybe we can um, uh, take these neural network systems, spin systems, um, and tune their dynamics, change the way each neuron fires or each spin flips around just by adding persistence, just by changing the single particle structure. Um, and maybe we can sculpt landscapes, maybe we can deepen wells around memories that are not well protected and increase the capacity of systems like this. So let me show you how this, how this happens in practice. So what we did is we took um, uh, a Hopfield-like system, but now it's slightly modified to have continuous spins as opposed to discrete spins. Um, and uh, we added a noise source, an extra noise source, uh, that we call an active noise source. And this is modeled, uh, this is modeled uh, on the kind of noise sources we, have, we see in active matter, this noise source unlike the kind of traditional noise sources one uses in a stochastic simulation, has a persistence time. Um, it, uh, it, it remembers itself for a certain amount of time tau, after which it forgets itself. At a single particle level, the diffusion constant of this noise source uh, is related to, to temperature in exactly the same way as you'd expect the diffusion constant to be related to, te to temperature. At a single particle level, this noise source can, has notions of pressure and, 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 and ideal gas-like law, like law and, and everything else, but, but, but collect Effectively, these things sort of lead to very interesting uh, uh, effects. Um, and this noise source also has a nice property that if you, if you set tau back to zero, you get back what looks like equilibrium again. So what I'm going to show you is I'm going to sh show you first simulations in which we compare simulations in which we have systems evolving with a thermal noise source uh, to simulations in which there is no thermal noise source and we just have a noise source which is active. I'm going to show you simulations in which I'm, uh, as, because I have, to, I have to equate two parameters, I have to sort of uh, call something an apple, call something an orange. I'm going, to, I'm going to compare simulations in which I have the same value of, I, 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 I have an active simulation with the same value of T here as the passive, as the passive system. Um, whether one can call it a temperature or not is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a complex involved question. I'm just going to give it a label. I'm going to label it as an active temperature and I'm going to compare it so that I have two energy scales to compare to, no other reason. Uh, and I'm going to show you what happens. So uh, uh, here, is, here is how, this is, here is how uh, one of these phase diagrams looks like uh, if, you do, uh, if you do these kinds of simulations. The blue regime here is, yeah. Sorry, what was the what? Ah, 
I'm sorry. So, um, so, so as I said, this is a, a modified version of Hopfield system. It's a spherical Hopfield model in which we have to have a, add a Lagrange multiplier to ensure that the spins, the sum of the squares of the spins uh, is equal to n. R of t is a Lagrange multiplier here. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a Lagrange, it's, it's a Lagrange multiplier, so it'll be time dependent. It'll sort of it'll, it'll take the value that is required to main, to ensure that the sum of the squares of the spin has a value n. Okay. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, and it's not super relevant. It will turn out that uh, it, it, this is a, a particular uh, feature or a bug in this particular thing. All these ideas work without this also. But it's for this, I'm going to show you stuff with this first. Okay? Um, all right. So uh, what I have here is uh, uh, the, kind of, uh, the kind of changes one gets if one looks, uh, if, if one draws out phase diagrams with activity and without activity. The blue line is the regime that we all previously saw where you have memory. You have, you have memory of, of you, at, um, uh, at zero temperature, you can store about 0.15 n spins. This is a slightly modified version of Hopfield's model, so the, the numbers are a bit off. Um, at a temperature of, of about one, all memory goes away. If we now come in and we, we, we don't have uh, this passive noise source, but we, we only have an active noise source, this persistence with, with, with the persistence, um, then it turns out that you can store memory in a much, much larger region. Uh, this goes all the way up to, a, in the scale, a, a temperature of seven, it turns out. Um, and just to give you an example of how recall or not recall looks like, here is a movie. Um, we, we, we stored a pattern that just reads out Chicago um, over here. Uh, so in the passive context, uh, the system has has enough thermal fluctuations, enough memory that it should not remember this pattern, uh, and then indeed that's what happens. So we, we started off our simulations in which the Chicago pattern is a small defect, and if we st as soon as you start the simulations, it immediately forgets it. It sort of goes away, it dissipates into into uh, into other states. Um, the same, uh, with the same initial conditions, the same connectivity, uh, we just play with the noise sources now and nothing else. This is what happens. You hardly see a change now in the active case, uh, and that is because there was a small defect. It got rectified almost immediately, and the system sort of found, uh, found the pattern it's supposed to, f supposed to find, and it just, stayed, uh, it just stays there for as long as you want it to be. Yeah. I have two, two questions. You said that in the second case there was uh, a small defect. Both of them have a small defect. So you're, you're checking for stability of the patterns, but yes. you're not making any claim about whether it's a nice region for retrieval, meaning it has a decent... Ah, I'll come to that in a few region. minutes, yeah. Okay. So, so, so this is all just simulation. So, so we start off with a pattern that sort of is 95% uh, uh, similar to the pattern that you stored. Uh, and in the passive case, it gets disintegrated, that active case, it sort of corrects those 5% mistakes and it comes down immediately. And the, and the second small question, just to be sure, because you showed and alluded to this uh, self-assembly Hopfield models yeah. that, that I also worked with, is this for self-assembly? No, this is, this is for Hopfield-like models. This yeah, this is spin, Hopfield, and then if I have Hopfield. time, which I won't, I will sort of, it, it works for self-assembly also. It okay. Does yeah. Okay, so, um, so these, are, these, are, these are from simulations, and so, uh, uh, the question one can ask is, okay, is this, how do we explain this? Is it actually a general effect or is it just like a, you know, a freak of, simil of a, freak, a numerical freak that, we've, that you've seen? Um, so what I'll do is I'll sort of show you three levels of, uh, of theoretical arguments. The first level is not really a theory. It's just uh, something to make us feel good. I'll show you a single particle picture where, uh, 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 where phenomenology sort of makes this look plausible, uh, and then I'll show you sort of uh, uh, re replica-like theory and if time and, uh, and a dynamical mean field theory where we can solve these things more exactly um, and uh, try to make sense of why this kind of phenomenology sh actually shows up. Um, and so the first sort of um, uh, the first sort of picture one can one one uh, one can write down, and this is a single particle picture, really, really bare bones, doesn't have doesn't have anything to do with doesn't have all the complexity of of a, of a rugged energy landscape or whatnot. But let's just imagine I have a single particle uh, that is da dancing around in a in a in a in a one dimensional potential with two wells. Um, I can watch it dance around with a with a passive noise source, and then I can also watch it dance around at the same notion of temperature, but now with an active noise source. And what ends up happening, and this is so, sort of apparent if you just stare at the movies, is that this active noise, uh, in the presence of an active noise, this particle actually ends up spending a fair more amount of time right around these minima. It 
almost ends up avoiding this barrier. And in the end, if you make a histogram of the positions uh, visited by the particle, uh, uh, and you just plot the histogram, what you'll see is that uh, in the presence of the passive noise source, the system actually visits what it's supposed to visit. It uh, spends time at the wells, crosses the barrier every so often. But in the presence of active noise, this, the, 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 the histogram that you get looks like the histogram you would have obtained if you had effectively an enhanced barrier. And so this sort of very, very minimal single particle-like picture, it looks like what active noise is doing is it's sort of uh, enhancing the barrier. It's sort of, uh, 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 it is uh, uh, causing the system to spend more time at the minima over here. Um, this is uh, a very minimal, a very very minimal setup, uh, but this sort of motivates why we might be why we might be seeing some of the things um, we are actually um, we are actually seeing. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to sort of uh, oh sorry. Um, it looks like uh, a fancy important sampling. I mean, you're you're basically important sampling this system. Ah, that's a very nice question actually. Um, so for people in the audience, would, so, so, uh, so the question is, is this, uh, is this really uh, uh, important sampling or not? Um, and so in a typical important sampling, you sort of go in with some intuition, right? So you, so, so you say, oh, I want my wells to get deeper, and so I'm going to add something that makes my wells deeper. Uh, and indeed, at the level of a single particle, you know, that's sort of what I'm, what, what, what I'm, what I'm doing. But the, the thing that I want to point out is that these memory, these, these noise sources have no clue of what of, of, the, of, the, of the full uh, rugged landscape that, that exists and all the memories that are stored, they're completely uncorrelated with, with the memories. And what's nice is that this kind of an idea ends up working out even if you go to a many body picture uh, where this notion of important sampling is not really the most, uh, it's not the best sort of notion. But however, your point is super nice because we think that, uh, uh, I'll, I, I can, I can I'll come to it later on, but uh, it is, at the single particle level, it looks like important sampling. At the many body level, it doesn't because the noise source doesn't really know where to go. We can't program it in any way. And indeed, that's what seems to be happening. Okay, there's another question. Okay. Um, so, uh, so uh, uh, to sort of do this thing at a slightly more um, at a slightly more rigorous level, we can adapt um, uh, ideas from uh, the theory of spin glasses and the theory of you know, how uh, spin glasses with, with, with memory. The first thing we can do is the so-called is the so-called replica trick. I won't show you all the math. I'll just sort of walk you through what we, what I think are the central points. So it turns out, in the limit of small persistence time, uh, systems of this sort, you can show that they satisfy to a very good approximation. The steady state satisfies. Uh, an effective Hamiltonian-like picture with an effective temperature. Uh, the effective temperature uh, is just equal to Ta uh, if there's only an active noise source. It's equal to T plus Ta if there are both noise sources. And this is only the limit of small tau. And in this effective temperature, in, in this effective Hamiltonian picture, which you, can, which you can work out analytically, what seems to be happening is uh, our coupling constants, the coupling constants that actually provide us wells to support memory end up being enhanced. Uh, this is a very perturbative calculation. There are caveats r related to this, so it doesn't work in, 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 um, in, in the most general framework, but it provides some intuition for how activity comes in and plays, plays a role. Uh, it Activity ends up uh, 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 strengthening the, uh, or renormalizing the values of, um, of the uh, of the connective of, of of the JIJ values that connect the neurons, and in some cases, in this particular case, it also gives us a higher order contribution. Um, and the end result of all these things ends up being um, that uh, there is a small enhancement in the region with memory. Um, you you end up simil you, you end up getting a system that almost looks like a system that has a different connectivity because you have activity, although you're not actually gone in and changed the connectivity in the system. Uh, this is a very small increase because this is a perturbative calculation. Uh, we can do this thing uh, more in a more uh, in a more exact way, but we lose a lot of intuition. We can use uh, we can do the we can do a dynamical mean field theory in which one keeps track of the order parameter that uh, 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 is appropriate for memory recall. Uh, one can keep track of the various correlation and response functions. And if you if you do this calculation, this sort of goes to your point uh, of I don't know, how stable it is. You see that it's actually uh, you see that uh, there is a large regime where you have where you have a, where you have memory, uh, and the memory also ends up. Uh, 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 scaling increasing with with tau the red region is memory so as you as you dial in more and more persistence you can actually get better and better memory um, in this uh, in the system so so uh, 
this is the picture we started off with. Um, we, we have this uh, issue uh, of uh, losing information because we, we, we got too greedy. Um, and what I've sort of tried to show you is that by adding activity into the system, you can potentially sculpt your landscape um, such that you can uh, still, uh, uh, you can still uh, be greedy for a bit. You pay the cost in terms of dissipation. You pay a cost because you have to add something active. Uh, but that's sort of the main takeaway message uh, so far. And I'm almost out of time. I'll just sort of throw up two last slides, and then and then I'm I'm, I'm almost out of time, right? Okay. I'm out of time. Okay, so let's throw up two, two slides. I sort of everything I talked so far was uh, situations like this, where the memory at zero temperature doesn't really go up. Uh, can this happen? We believe it can. Um, I have no time to sort of show this to you right now, but um, in a, in a certain class of models with, uh, with with p spin connectivity, we think we can actually get to regimes where you shake the system, you make it active, and uh, it remembers a lot more than what it did even at zero temperature potentially. Um, so that's where I'll end. I showed you uh, stuff with this Hopfield model, how activity can sculpt landscapes. Uh, these ideas we have actually uh, also worked out in the context of things like self-assembly, where you have real particles moving around in potentials. You can sort of remember more. We've also worked out these ideas in the context of neural networks, searching for solutions. Um, and uh, in, a, in a certain class of student-teacher models, uh, we can show that um, uh, adding uh, persistence to uh, your noise sources as you search for solutions actually ends up uh, uh, letting you find much solution, much better solutions much faster. So I'll stop here. Uh, we think this, this, these ideas can um, uh, provide a knob to use dynamics to tune um, uh, memory to, to sort of make things uh, classify better. Um, I'll stop here and take questions if any. Thank you for a lovely talk. Uh, as usual, first questions go to students and postdocs. Hi. Uh, th th thank you. Very interesting talk, uh, especially the Hopfield uh, summary. And uh, that was very nicely done. Um, uh, about, uh, so, so you said that uh, the active noise enhances uh, barriers. So I don't understand really your fraternity landscape then. And how, uh, how do you find that in your, in your model? Uh, how do I find how do I find this kind of a thing in the model? So that's, I mean, that's not enhancing bias. That's oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, 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 that's, so that's a, it's a great point. So, in some sense, it's sort of it's sort of uh, relative. What um, so if we end up um, so if if you look right around the the the, uh, the pattern that's being stored. You see that what activity does is it sort of in uh, it can lower the effective energy of the pattern um, in this in this effective Hamiltonian like picture. That statement is 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 is, is reasonable. Uh, in the large tau limit, it's just a statistical statement. I can't sort of back it up with any with any intuitive calculations at, at this point. Uh, but in this in this context, um, uh, uh, lowering a well and raising a barrier are equivalent because the the sort of top. The, uh, th that's sort of the picture. That's um, um, uh, in in this in this in the specific context. That's how we think about we, we think about it. We go back and forth between lowering a barrier, lowering the energy well, and raising and uh, uh, and effectively raising a barrier. Um, but the more detailed answer to your question would be: uh, I showed you the single particle picture in which I had. I had a real barrier, and the barrier did go up. How 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 appropriate is that for the many-body context? And I don't have a very good answer for that, other than um, the sort of unintuitive analytical calculations you have done so far. So that's something you're still thinking about, and I don't have a very satisfying answer for that question. OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? So you consider only soft spin model, in which you have the spherical condition, like sum up to n square. Do you think that if you consider has spin model, so plus minus one, right? Uh, can you replace the active uh, temperature terms by the one cell consistently defined noise term? Because in that case, you have the DMFT, and the DMFT will give you the cell consistency noise. And that noise, I suspect that will produce the same effect as the active noise you consider now. Uh, that's a very nice point. We haven't done that. Uh, we haven't been able to sort of uh, formulate that really well, but um, uh, I believe it's I believe it's possible. Uh, we sort of went off in, in a few other directions, but very nice point. I think it's possible, and I, we should we should talk more about that. Thanks. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, so you said that 
one of the um, the aims of adding uh, activity was also to to make so to make minima more robust. Uh, but what I was thinking is that if you have like in the cartoon of uh, particles in a potential, active particles in a potential, if you have large persistence, you can have accumulation at boundaries. And I was thinking like uh, it's so what I found counterintuitive is that when you have very large persistence, in any case, your memory, uh, so your performance of, uh, of learning uh, improves mm -hmm. in any case. And I thought like, uh, so why can't you have instead that like this sort of accumulation outside of the, of the minima of your memory, maybe wor can't it worsen somehow the, yeah. the, the yeah. performances? That's, a, that, that's also a great point. So um, uh, one of the things I sort of, uh, one of the things I uh, didn't talk about much is the is the nature of this kind of a phase diagram. Um, and so what happens in this phase diagram is that there are two different reg regimes. There's one region here where your uh, memory states are really the ground states. They are, they are the sort of uh, uh, global free energy uh, minima. And in this state, your memory states are metastable. You're, there are other configurations that compete with memory that can be more stable. Um, and in a sense, uh, uh, what might be happening is that you might indeed be creating other spurious memories of the activity, or you might be deepening other wells, but you might be deepening the well that you want uh, sufficiently such that you actually inc improve the, the extent of this metastable region. And that's, that's also perfectly fine. That also gives you retrieval. Uh, it's not the most robust retrieval. So what we, have, what we are sort of trying to do now is to sort of figure out uh, regimes in which uh, you really, really get robust retrieval, which is error-free retrieval. How does that scale? I have, we haven't sort of completed, completed all those things. But that will sort of get to the qu kind of questions you're trying to ask. Yeah. Thanks. Um, OK. So great talk, really interesting. Uh, I was wondering, I mean, the brain is obviously an active system. So I was thinking, can one use this sort of idea to understand uh, things about neural data or cortical traces? I, I like, I, I, no, I, I like, this is, this is minimal. This is, this is super minimal. Uh, and it'll be, it'll be very dishonest of me to say anything like that. Um, so at this point, um, yeah, there are there are there are there are many realms of many realms of com complexity. There there are some classes of models that uh, that work well, and which is why I put this thing here. So there is um, it turns out um, uh, a Hopfield-like model for place cells in the hippocampus, um, and uh, uh, and that has been well characterized. It's sort of well understood, and in that particular context, I think one can use these ideas to sort of uh, uh, argue to sort of at least in a in a, in a minimal condition. Uh, uh, show how dynamics can help you remember more, remember more spatial locations. Uh, the, 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 the sort of most, uh, the, the question of making real connections with biology, I think that's like a huge bridge to cross, which I hope to at some point, but right now this is, let's, uh, this, is a, this is this is a question of the level of uh, what can connectivity give you and how can, we, how can we sort of modulate memory by using this extra knob we have access to, which, which biology does have access to, but I, I have to make that, yeah. Uh, a very nice talk and uh, enjoyed it. Uh, I just want to uh, bring uh, your attention to uh, a piece of work we did like 10 years ago published on PNS. So we emphasize the other aspect of associated memory models. And, uh, as we know that the, uh, the crucial assumption of the associated memory model from John Hopfield is the connection has to be symmetric. And that is not quite what biology yes. is. Uh, <laughs> yes. is. The reality is. And uh, so we focus on a different aspect of what you did. We focus on if you have asymmetric connections, what, what happened. Um, so if you increase the asymmetry, what, what happens? And what we have found is a little bit opposite of what yes. you, you have found. So yeah, so, so in, in fact, the, the number of the point attractors are less. But uh, as a result of the activity, the, uh, the possibility of the emergence of the uh, cycles, the, the cycles yeah. starts to uh, yeah. emerge. And, and if you count that as uh, continuous attractors, the number of the attractors, so you could say that uh, the capacity increases because of the continuation, uh, continuous attractors emergence. So interesting. So yeah, no, that's a that's a very nice observation, um, and uh, I, you know, this is sort of uh, this kind of uh, noise source, even though it's non-equilibrium, it doesn't have that kind of a symmetry. 
Uh, and we have started wondering about that. I didn't know this paper, so I'll look it up, but uh, that's a very nice observation. Yeah. Thank you. It's almost the same question, but related with ratchet effect. With, with uh, color noise, you can have ratchet effects if the uh, landscape is asymmetric. You, know? you can have motion. Yes. So here, maybe instead of motion, you can have kind of flows or yeah. limit cycles or something yeah. like that, um, so without with with symmetric uh, interaction. Uh, that's a very nice point. Uh, yeah, I haven't I haven't considered that. So just to sort of uh, fill in this, this old work by Heim Somtrinsky, where they took models like this and they added in. Uh, an asymmetric term that allows you to sort of hop between memories, um, and what they had, what they, what they sort of saw there was, in the presence of dynamics that have certain kinds of time delays, you can actually get get nice limit cycle oscillations. Um, so each, so you, you you just link up all these attractors together in a giant cycle. I haven't considered this ratchet-like effect uh, as a possibility. That's super nice. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. I I have a, qu a question and, and also a related comment. Actually, the first the question is that. In, in many cases, at least as far as I know, if you are adding a kind of non-equilibrium aspect to a dynamics, then you stabilize things which were in equilibrium not stable. So there is this stabilizing yeah. effect, which seems to lead in the direction of new spurious minima with respect to equilibrium at least. So that does not seem to get that intuition of deepening the wells that perhaps you see close to equilibrium but farther from equilibrium, it seems like you're creating things which were unstable before become stable. Uh, I mean, no. So, 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 so wh uh, what happens in? Uh, th 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 that, that's 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 a great point. We have wondered a lot about that. Uh, 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 what I what I can say is that um, in the in the classic kind of uh, in the classic uh, Hopfield picture, also uh, you you have a lot of metastable states here. Uh, it's just that um, your your memory state is sufficiently metastable that it's it's recoverable. So if you start close enough, close enough is, is, is has been defined well. Um, you sort of you, you know you can sort of go into it. We think activity works in that kind of a, in that kind of a context. It can create spurious minimas, um, but um, in this sort of metastable regime. Um, the, the sort of uh, spuriosity that's created is not sufficiently high to disrupt the uh, the memory that you've that you that that you've stored, and that's sort of what we see consistently across many many classes of models. Not only this, we have other continuous uh, models. We have stuff in free space, and that's sort of what we see all uh, in in everything um, in everything we have done. Um, there is also a different point here about. Um, how activity uh, may work if you sort of uh, change the con change the connectivity of the network itself. If you sort of have larger connectivity, not just two body, but many body connectivity. I think in that in that case, you, we have a few arguments that we can uh, we we can make that shows that even the uh, the the globally stable regime can be enhanced. Uh, but but that intuition comes uh, that that intuition is a bit is a, is a bit more is a bit different, uh, and and that also requires many body interactions, not just two body interactions. So if you allow me comment uh, related to this remark about asymmetric uh, coupling and about ratchet effect, in fact one can go even much further, meaning that instead of storing the patterns in the conservative part of the forces, ah. one can also think about storing patterns in like kinetic components related to, I don't know, I mean, things which are in the non-equilibrium, which become very important in the non-equilibrium. So if you're going away from equilibrium, then these kinetic parameters, they kind of steer you to, to what is the stable minima, and you can store the patterns there. And we have called it, of course, a frenetic steering. Yes, yes, where, yes. Where you yes. Can, where you oh, can that's a that. very nice, yeah, I, I should follow up on that. I, I had not made that connection, so I should follow, should follow up on that. Thanks for that. Hi. Uh, so, if you have a, if you in your simulation start with a finite tau, tau and you start decreasing tau, you are, do you actually see a loss of memory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, if uh, all these things, they sort, there's no, there is no viscosity or element in these things. So, you, you you change tau immediately, you'll sort of see that things that you were remembering, you sort of forget. Yeah. So, all, all that all that happens dynamically. Yeah, that'll happen. OK, 
Okay. Oh. It's a pretty basic question. I was just wondering in the kind of simplified schematic at the very beginning, whether the spurious minima you talk about are the same as chimeric patterns or a different kind of... Uh, you, can, you can have... Uh, um, so, so the chimeric patterns sort of emerge mainly with... Um, uh, I, I cheated a bit. The, the chimeric patterns emerge mainly with local connectivity as opposed to global connectivity. So in the Hopfield model is globally connected and kills off the chimeric patterns. Um, but uh, yeah, if you if you have if you have shorter range connectivity, the chimeric patterns would be a notion of a spurious memory. Okay. So the chimeric patterns are more about these flat lands of potential. Uh, sort of. Uh, yeah. So 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 if you have short range connectivity, the picture slightly changes. Uh, but it is slightly elevated, and so you sort of form some of them, you, you nucleate a few different things, and then you compete, and then you lose. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Um, yeah, so uh, in the initial example you showed where uh, you had two wells and there was increased barrier, is that, first part, my, first part of my question, is that like similar to how there's pile up at boundaries of active systems? Sort of, because you look at, um, you look at the wells, they're the, re the, the edges of the wells, the, they're the regions of the highest curvature, so that's where the walls are. And so you sort of pile things up more there, uh, which is why uh, this notion of sort of uh, having a lot of spurious memories is actually, I think it does happen. You can have other cases where you sort of have small, uh, small irregularities that, that can get magnified. Right, yeah, so that brings me to the second point. So have you studied what sort of patterns are more memorable than others? So ah, that's a that good would depend on where it is near the boundary in some Yeah, yeah, space. yeah. So, so I should have clarified this. So in the, in the context of the calculations I've shown you, everything is uh, for randomly sampled patterns. You sample from a distribution. It's all random. Uh, and so there's no notion then of, you know, what is what. Um, but um, in some of these, um, uh, in, some of the, in some of the other contexts, like, which I didn't show, it's a colloid-like context where we, can, where we can recover things. I think for sure um, some classes of patterns, patterns that are sort of more compact, can potentially sort of be, uh, uh, can potentially be realized more readily uh, with, uh, with this AOP-like noise, especially if the interactions between the colloids has some notion of uh, you know, hard repulsion. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't worked that out completely, uh, but I'm sure it'll be there. Uh, everything I've sort of to shown you um, is for patterns that are completely agnostic to any notion of you know where they are in the landscape. Okay. Okay. We're uh, beyond time, so we'll uh, thank all the speakers of today, <laughs> and there is one announcement. Yeah, sorry. Just one second. Uh, a couple of announcements about the poster session. So it starts at five in Adriatico. Uh,